Jesus' name, we command you to go. Lexapro's got that demon on lockdown. Well, what's up with that, God? Is that you know, super real for me? But what does that mean for others? I command you to leave in Jesus' name, whatever that does. I mean, it was so numbing. I mean, it was just like the hairs on my neck. Stood up. I will go to my grave with this as clear as day. I was woken up from a dead sleep to the point of standing next to my bed. And as audible as I'm talking to you, I just heard, run to Annie. Once he declared Satan to be his father, he found such a power and a rush that he would never let go of. I don't know what it was, but the fact that we did that little ritual ceremony or whatever it was, and then that kind of prompted the thing to occur, uh, right. that is creepy as hell. She, you know, didn't say like, well, where's dad? But normally that would have been a thing that would have come out of her mouth. So that was eerie to begin with. Oh, I feel kind of crazy sharing it sometimes because it's um, something that was like really personal, you know. So when I was going through my mental health crisis, a dear friend of mine, let's say 20 years, my elder, prayed for me from the bottom of his heart. I mean, he loved me. And in this prayer, he connected my suicidal condition to a demonic situation, like a demon of suicide. And I don't personally believe this is what was going on with me, but I wasn't offended. So Pastor Chip Judd, a familiar voice on this podcast, he's a licensed therapist, and he actually brings this tension up in the next audio clip of this episode between mental illness and demonic activity, sharing his suspicion that there is probably a good chance when one is suicidal, there's probably demonic influence. And he even talks about a correlation between many aspects of schizophrenia and those of demonic possession. So back in my younger days, man, and my spirit, my religious context, like if you believed in any spirit outside of demons, angels, and the Holy Spirit, it was pretty much a sinful belief because you're saying people can come back from the dead and interact with humans on this earth after they died. And we were taught that speaking to people from the dead was not only un biblical and sinful, but also very dangerous considerations, heretical. So I know, respect, and hang with people who think this is a material world, and that is it, man. No supernatural. I hang with people who literally rebuke their car in the name of Jesus when it doesn't start. So (laughs) I used to err on the side of demons for everything, like just super always geared up, heightened awareness always about a demon could do this, a demon could do that. And now I probably lean too far the other way, maybe not giving spirits enough credit. (laughs) I also know and respect and hang with people who claim Christian faith, but don't believe in actual demons, but They rather see the term demon as like an allegorical personification of the true darkness and evil that can be in a person's soul. I have an experience in which I did this as a kid. I was having such bad nightmares, honestly, after seeing an exorcism on 2020 on a Friday night. And I remember trying to sleep on the floor in my parents' room during a fall night, windows open, and as a terrified seventh grader, a mix of dreams and just being terrified by what I saw on TV, I, I felt like there were demons trying to torment me from the daggum window in my parents' bedroom right above my head. Now, today, I don't believe that is the case. I just think I was dreaming. But when it comes to what was actually happening, why does it matter? I mean, an important truth remains. Either way, I was being tormented. I mean, similar to the guy that prayed against the demon of suicide for me. Whether or not I had one, you sure as hell have my full permission to personify my struggle as a demon trying to put me through hell so I'd give up and kill myself because you know what? It felt like a demon trying to put me through hell so I'd give up and kill myself. (laughs) And I am being allegorical there. 
So this episode is a good representation of where I'm at with all this. I don't know what I believe about any of it, but I do believe. I do believe in a spiritual realm, and I still do believe in demons. I can also entertain theologies that doubt this. I mean, my question has always been, if demons are real, then God, why would you allow them to keep at it? I mean, after rebelling, turning their back on you, why didn't you just destroy them or at least keep them from us? Keep those things from us, man. We've got enough issues on our own. We can destroy ourselves without demons' help. So why would you let evil presences make everything worse for us when apparently you don't have to let them do it at all? I mean, who knows? But when it comes to my belief in the supernatural, I I just, I can't not believe because of some things in my life. Very few, but these few occurrences, I believe there's like 0.5% chance or less that they could have transpired without a higher being's involvement. I mean, I've had a crazy dream experience in which I dreamed the most bizarre dream of how I would end up marrying my now wife. It was very bizarre how it would end up, and how we ended up together happened like the dream said it would, and it was very bizarre, and there's no way I'll ever stop believing this. It's too crazy. A certain aspect of this spiritual encounter that I see sharing common common ground with other encounters, the one who experienced it is not only convinced that it really happened and it was not of this world, they don't really care also whether or not you believe. They can't afford to care because they know most people won't believe them. And a huge reason for this is the person that it happened to probably wouldn't believe you if you told them a story that happened to you and not to them. So on this episode, you are hearing from regular folks on experiences that most of them believe were supernatural encounters. And this includes keen awareness of demonic presence God sending a little girl, her dad back, just for a split second to say bye to her one last time. High schoolers, me being one of those high schoolers, apparently inviting a spirit to come out when we were out in the middle of nowhere. So some of these stories, I I believe wholeheartedly, there's only a supernatural explanation. Some of these stories, I was there to witness myself. So sit back and relax. What do you make of all this? So happy Halloween, and when you go trick-or-treating, don't forget your mask. (laughs) You get it? Mask? Like you're going to be wearing a Halloween mask, and it's like you have to wear masks because of COVID? Dang dang it. Dang it! I didn't fall well at all. (laughs) Okay. So guys, this is Chip Judd, a dear friend and guide in my life, and he truly believes, as he tells this story, that there was a demon bullying his wife that affected some very deep things about her. So he tells us this story right here, but when we're popping into the conversation, he's explaining why he doesn't make clear distinctions between mental illness and spiritual warfare. It's, it's not always one or another, and here's why. The reason I can't say there's no connection between the two is this. There's sometimes you're working with someone and you would watch the behavior or whatever, the condition, the illness or whatever. Yeah. And you would ask this question. Is it possible there's spiritual warfare slash demonic involvement? And and the answer might be yes, but it gets trickier than that. Did the demon cause the problem? Right. Or is the demon piggybacking Oh, yeah. So in other words, let's say somebody deals with depression. They have a physiological brain issue that causes them to deal with depression. It's not a stretch for me to think that's going to make them easier prey right. for a demon to get in their head with ideas, words, thoughts, phrases, etc. Right. Like I think suicide, it's impossible. For, 
I, I believe in mental illness that can go far enough. But I believe suicide is a great example where there's got to be a point where a demon whispers. Really? There's got to be a point where a demon says, I got a good idea for you. I know how you could end all this pain. Yeah. Now, do I believe a demon could do that? Yes. Do I believe it's always a demon? I don't know that I can go that far. Yeah. But it's not a stretch for me to believe that I've suffered with something long enough. My 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 thoughts are already difficult to manage because of the physiological issue, anxiety, depression, whatever, schizophrenia, for goodness sake. Um, and then, and there's patterns even to that. Even as I say that, I'm triggered, Joey. But it's interesting that stone cold secular psychologists, the patterns of schizophrenia, there's such consistency to them. There's almost always hearing voices and, and God complexes. Now, I am not saying that means, oh, that's textbook, that's demons. But it is kind of interesting that that fits the MO. Yeah. It fits the MO of someone who wanted to pray to God. Right. Ezekiel 14, I'm going to make myself like God. So I believe in split reality, parallel reality, I'd call it, seen and unseen, spirit and not spirit. And I believe it's hard to read the Bible without that mindset. So uh, it's it's just a part of my worldview. We're dealing with a, an issue, pretty heavy issue, and it revolved around a, a, a critical controlling parent. And it, it would really vex my wife. And it created in her this, this really disproportionate response. Like she would... If I, there were certain areas, if I touched them, her response would go from a, a one to a 10. I mean, you know, my wife, <clears throat> she would say things, horrible things, horrible things with a, with a growly voice. No, no, that's not where I'm going. <laughs> You'll see where I'm going in a minute. Cause this is the whole thing about possession or uh, oppression and influence and all that. This would be more influence and oppression, not possession. Right. Um, I mean, I'm talking like dude slam doors. I mean, say hurtful, ugly things to me Yeah. that, that hours later she'd be in tears apologizing, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, um, so we're having one of these kind of moments and I'm addressing something and I, you know, I'm, I'm weird when that, when someone escalates, I generally go the opposite and I kind of, I get real calm and I'm great in those kind of moments. Cause you, I just don't get pulled out. And, um, and I basically just said something like, well, th this is not acceptable. And she, you know, got mad and whatever, grabbed her car keys and took off. And, uh, and I'm like sitting there like stunned. And um, I hear the car. We live in an apartment. I hear the car start and wheels squealing. <laughs> off she went. Uh, and I'm like, whoa. I'm like, I'm scared she's going to hurt herself. Yeah. I'm like, so I'm praying. And I don't remember how long, but a little while later she comes back. And, you know, you could tell whatever that was had passed. And she's kind of like scared. And she's like, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know what that was. And it was just kind of really weird. Yeah. And I said, well, I said, well, let's pray. And, and we started to pray and, and I, and I, and I started to rebuke the devil. And I said, you know, devil in Jesus name, you leave my wife, you quit tormenting my wife, whatever. And, and so we're sitting on the couch. If, if, if we were on video, I, you'd see what I'm trying to say, but you can, I'm here and my yeah. wife's here. Well, right to my directly in front of me and to my right, I felt a presence and it was a presence. I'm feeling goosebumps right now. It was like a presence that was glaring at me. Like, how dare you? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and and I said, you will go in Jesus' name. And my, so you, you felt that communication or you heard it? Like you, I didn't you, hear it. Yeah. No. no. Yeah. But it felt as real as you in yeah. front of me right now. Yeah. And I feel this presence. But here's why. Here's to me what makes it even more believable, honestly. Yeah. I'm rebuking this thing. And as it's arguing with me, it's slowly edging toward the door of the apartment. So what? A shadow? Uh, no. I feel its presence. How do you I know? Don't see it. How do you know it's moving towards? I just the door? sense it. Yeah. It's like I can feel it. 
in in that unseen yeah. realm, it's like I can feel it. It's it's over my right shoulder, then it's in front of me, and then it's over my left shoulder, and it's moving. The door of the apartment's right over here, across uh, beyond my wife to my left. Yeah, and literally, I I continue to rebuke this thing, and I feel it, like like you know how like a you tell a teenager go to your room. And they just kind of drop their head and they fight you every inch, but they do it. Yeah. It was just like that. It was like this pouting teenager glaring at me, but had to obey. Yeah. And that, it, that thing, and again, I didn't see it, but it was, it was almost the same as seeing it. Yeah. I felt its trajectory all the way to the door and then it went out the door and you could feel the whole room change. Did Colleen change? You could feel Colleen like, what just happened? And did she, was she different from that point on when it came to that yes. specific? Whoa. Yes. Whoa. Yes. So it's neat because you bring some, you know, you have some credibility with my listeners. If I'm talking to anybody else, I mean, my honest reaction would be like, you felt something. I mean, I feel stuff all the time. But for you to say it, it's, it's, it's different. Are there any inside of you right now that we need to attend to? <laughs> yes, but that's why I'm on medication. <laughs> Lexapro's sorting it all out. Lexapro's got that demon on lockdown. <laughs> yeah. Ellen Morrow, you guys know and love her. So she tells a story. She was a she was a child when this story happened. A family friend was spending the night over with her parents. He happened to be in the room right next door to Ellen's room. He was staying in the room next to mine. And one night I had had this dream, what I thought was a dream. And I woke up and I just, I, it was sort of a mix between seeing and feeling this very, very, very dark kind of cloudy creature, right? It wasn't yeah. vivid or anything. It was just this heavy feeling. And I, I, I thought I saw it. Then I thought that was a terrible dream. And you know, I did the thing that I was always taught to do with, which is like, I command you to leave in Jesus name, whatever that does. You know what I mean? Okay. So I ended up going back to sleep the next night. Um, so our friend Todd again is staying in the next room. The next night I woke up and this time I know for sure I was awake. I opened my eyes because I sensed something was next to my bed or looking at me or on top of me, something. And I didn't feel the, the weight, like some, somebody wasn't laying on top of me, but I felt the presence, you know, when someone's just like in your face, Yeah. I opened my eyes and I saw very clearly a bl very black, like the blackest of black. And it was like a cloaked creature and it had kind of greenish eyes and it was maybe in your face, in my face. And so you're not hovering, sleeping. No, hovering. And you're over not me. tripping. It was maybe a foot or two above me. Right. And you're not I, tripping. Like I on anything. was 12. Probably gotcha. it was. I was <laughs> afraid of drugs. And so I kind of climb out from under it because I'm terrified to touch this thing, you know get sucked into the black hole of hell or something. I mean, terrified has got to be an understatement. Yeah. And so I, I kind of client crawled out from under it and I start, you know, s screaming and running out to the, um, the dining room. Now, right when that happened, right when I go out there, Todd comes out of his room. Now I thought, he came out because he heard me screaming, right? But I remember him going into my room first, and then he came out and said, "What's going on? Are you okay?" Well, okay, he so told, wait, he you you left your room screaming, right? And then he, ran to he, the dining room or living room, and then 
And then he came out to check on me in my mind. Well, but he had gone into my room first, even though he knew I had gone to the living room. He said that he woke up, not because I screamed. He woke up because he heard a man's voice in my room saying, get out, get out. And then I screamed. So that, so he got up to Ooh, check This on gave me. me chills. That gave but me I chills. had already, I had already screamed and run into the, to the living room. So I had thought it was probably just a bad dream until he told me that he heard a man's voice in my room saying, get out, get out. The story that you're about to tell is literally one of my favorite stories like that. It doesn't, it doesn't even belong to me, but I tell so many people this story. And so I'm curious. Yes, I do. Oh my gosh. It's one of the coolest stories I've ever heard in my life. And what I love about, uh, what I love about this story too is, you know, obviously even when you and I hear stories like this, like we're skeptical and I bet some people would be like, oh, it's just a grieving widow. She, she had medication. I mean, you know, she was probably hearing things, but you had one of your best friends in the car with you, correct? Yeah. Thank yeah. God. Cause I think I would have questioned all of it up and down. This is Liz Miller, one of my closest, talking about being in the car with their best friend, two-year-old daughter, and month-old son. Now, she was newly widowed at the time. We're talking just a week ago. Her husband passed away in a tragic car accident. Now, Liz's daughter, like any little girl that age, would always ask for daddy when he was gone for work or errands. And at this point, not since before her dad's passing had she even mentioned him until this occurred as the four of them were driving right past the spot on the road that took the life of daddy and husband. So we were driving and um, my friend Jen was in the front seat with me and Hannah was in the um, car seat in the back. And right as we were coming up to that section of the road where his accident had happened and just like it was quiet nobody was talking in the car everybody's just so still shocked that anything had just happened and so there wasn't a ton of conversation happening that day anyways but in the car we definitely were not having a conversation and all of a sudden and just like the sweetest most elated voice she was just like daddy And it was right when we got to that spot where the accident happened and I just froze and like my heart just like went up into my throat and I looked at Jen and Jen looked at me and nobody said anything. And she just kept saying, daddy, as if she saw him. And I looked at Jen and then after probably what felt like a minute, it was probably 10 seconds. She said, Jen said to me, she did just say that. Because she could see in my eyes, did that just happen? And did I hear that right? And she said, she said that. And I was like, did she just say daddy? And she was like, she just saw him. And I was like, that is just like, it's awesome. I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And I think some people might think it's sad. And I just took like such a piece from it. I loved that feeling that she saw him. And I love that he appeared for her. I love that he had that moment for her to see him the first time she crossed over that spot the last time she saw him dead and that time she saw him I guess on the side of the road waving or smiling and she was just like shouting for him but she wasn't sad she wasn't like turn around or stop or come back she didn't say anything like that she was just saying it as if I don't know. It's like in her brain, she knew it wasn't something we would stop for, which in like your normal, you know, thought process, you would think, well, would you stop and turn around? Or would they say, why aren't you turning around? But that just didn't come out of her mouth. She was right. just so excited. To, she was satisfied with seeing him and something in her brain knew that it wasn't something that um, you could stop for. Like it was right. just, she was just great for the site to see him and she was excited and it just brought me 
a ton of joy to know that that was what she saw the last, the first time she passed that spot, as opposed to a horrible sound coming out of her right. mouth or a horrible fear or scream. Um, who knows like what would have or could have come out of her mouth considering what happened the last time she passed that, that yeah. part of the road. So the question I have, uh, obviously our, our kids are growing up together. I'm very much so still close to your children. Does she yeah. know about this story yet? No, no. When, when do you, when are you going to gift her with that? Because I've part of my story or, or part of the telling of the story. When I tell people, I'm like, I really think God gave Hannah Ray a gift. And one day Hannah Ray's mom is going to be able to say, your dad made it a point to make sure he said goodbye to you. I don't know when I'll tell her. And I think it was just such a crucial time for her to have that reassurance that he's there. And I think it was important for him to be able to somehow let her see him and talk to him and hear him and hear all the things that I think she needed to hear. So here we have Kayla and Tyler Thompson. So they sat down to tell me some stories. We're going to drop right into a story that Kayla is telling about a friend of hers in college who was very lonely and actually admits to inviting a spiritual buddy to hang with her. So they were friends. Her and a spirit were friends and... With Kayla, before we drop into this conversation, we, we've, we've pretty much ironed out the fact that mental health-wise, outside of depression, her friend was good. And once again, the common ground in this story, and you'll hear from Kayla, is it doesn't really matter what anybody says. She knows what she heard, and she will believe it, <laughs> as you can tell, for the rest of her life. So um, all of this was taking place in the middle of the night um, in, you know, her, her room. Um, and I was not aware of any of this going down. Um, and this is kind of my story that I can attest to firsthand. Um, I was in my room, which was on the total other end of nowhere near uh, where she was. And I was a, I was a rule follower. Yeah. So I had <laughs> never broken curfew. Right. I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I was in my bed sleeping in a dead sleep. And I, I will go to my grave with this as clear as day. I was woken up from a dead sleep to the point of standing next to my bed. And as audible as I'm talking to you, I just heard run to Annie. And so I I did, I didn't think twice about where I was, what was going on or the the time of night. Nothing. So you, you, you were woken, awake. Is it awakened or woken? I don't know. I'm, I'm not woke enough to know that. (laughs) Uh, yeah. <laughs> but so you stood by your bed. I mean, you went from deep sleep to getting up, standing by your bed and then hearing someone say, run to Annie. Was it a scary voice yeah. or was it a sweet it voice? Was yeah, I, I was. I'm fully convinced that it was God. Yeah. I, I, it was it was as I, I just was. I was peaceful with it. I was sure of it. And I just knew like that's what I'm doing. Southern like, accent or anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'd be awesome you run to annie right now boy i would love god so much more <laughs> all right so you got to tell us what happened uh yeah so i did i ran as <laughs> fast as i could and busted in a room like never thinking twice about anything and i busted in a room to see her on the ground and people around her casting things out of her like this whole scene of like to utter confusion. And I can remember the th- most distinct thing was the fear in everybody's face. Like she was scared. They were scared. Like nobody knew what was going on. They're praying, but she's, you know, everybody's just freaked out. And um, her and her face just changing from her and then not wow. her. Like I just knew it. And, so what you've seen, um, I don't know if you've seen scary movies and stuff, but what you've seen in documentaries and movies and stuff, kind of like that sort of feel of like, holy shit, yeah, this is real. That, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No. 
was was. was there any like demon speaking through her or anything like that so she yeah um she at the point of come of coming in that i witnessed to um i could first it was it was her and just her scared and then i knew it wasn't her anymore and um she just started yelling at me like or i shouldn't say at me like at in general you know and felt you know just a just a a screech and an awful you know um you know kind of sound and and it was almost i think a little bit of of taunting at the other people in the room yeah. you know the weird turn i guess <laughs> of my story is my um charismatic uh <laughs> teachers yeah. if you will um they like pushed me out of the room they're like you know yeah. <laughs> so i was physically removed um from the room at that point when all this kind of took place um they and uh shut the door and then they carried on with with their things and that's the second time where i felt very sure like just don't move from here and pray for them in the room and it wasn't even specifically her it was for them in the room um yeah and so and that's just kind of what happened i mean that was kind of the um, remainder of the, the evening. So God woke you up as like an additional prayer person. You think? I do. I, I don't know. I I think I think it was, but not to pray, for but her not for her. I think it was almost over the situation. Yeah. yeah. Um. I think it was over the people that were in there that had no idea what the hell they were doing, and the <laughs> um and and for her like, and I don't think it was for her to be delivered. I think it was for her to be removed from that situation because the. The um, crazy thing is that in that moment, um, it, it, it just was utter chaos and nobody really knew what they were doing. And it was just um, a lot of tears, a lot of hurt, a lot of fear, a lot of fear. Um, and it came to a point where there, there was one other um, good friend kind of in the mix that was a, a leader and in there. And he was able to kind of eventually stop what was happening. Um, and, and she was not delivered from anything that evening. It, it was uh, just a, a struggle. And and then everybody was just afraid. <laughs> um, and so people were always trying to, like, cast things out in corner. Oh so it was I, I'm it just was so going bad. to my writing class, <laughs> yeah. please. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a year later, after that happened, it was like a full year later. I can remember her running into back at school, summer had gone by everything, or back at school the next year, um, running into my room with the purest joy and excitement I've ever seen. And she said, it's gone. Whoa. Like it is gone. Whoa. Yeah. And, she, and nobody else was with her. She, she was totally by herself in a her room. And she said, I physically saw it coming like to me. And I just said, enough. Like in Jesus name, enough, no more, I'm done. And she said, I saw it leave and it's gone. Jeez. And she, she was totally delivered in that manner. Like never dealt with it again. Yeah. Like, Did she say what she saw? Was it just kind of like a darkness it, leave? Or? That's exactly what, yeah. She said she could physically see the darkness coming down the hallway, like to her room. This is Jason Lott, a good friend of mine. Back in 2010, we went to Haiti on a summer, the group of folks to build some houses for displaced Haitians. Now, after a long and hot day's work, we were all showered, feeling good, resting and hanging. Cool breeze, good friends, beautiful landscape, clear, wondrous skies. And little did we know, we were all in for a treat. The million dollar question before we even get to the story, I got to know, do you think it was God? Oh, man. I, I mean, it, it's hard not to believe that it wasn't only because of the setting we were in. And, you know, we we're on a mission trip to Haiti. Yeah. Um, I mean, just uh, I felt like the presence was there to begin with. I mean, and it could have been just the admiration that these people were showing us and just, um, right. you know, everything that surrounded the situation. But, you know, I, I have a hard time believing that all of that was just coincidence, to be honest. 
right? There's <laughs> <laughs> just too many things oh, involved know, that, that for it to be, you know, all of it to play out that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so I'll kick it off because I think the first thing that happened, I think you were even a little fuzzy on, but I'm pretty positive. So we're, we're in Haiti. It's at the end of the day. So we're super psyched to be done with the work. The sun's gone down. So it's cool. And we all like each other. So we're hanging out, we're sitting kind of on the edge of this garage warehouse sort of thing. And it's beautiful outside, beautiful sky. And you just said something in passing. You weren't even talking to God or anything. I I made it about God. So you basically just said, man, I wish they would just turn these lights off because they're like big, big floodlights of of some sort that was just kind of, you know, taking away from the the vibe and literally (laughs) immediately they turned off. (laughs) So, so I turned to you and I was like, dude, like, you got some power with the man upstairs. <laughs> and, and then what did I ask you, man? What did I ask you? <laughs> and so, I mean, we're sitting there and it was, you know, the, the lights, because we were talking about, you know, had anybody seen shooting stars before? And because I used to love the lay on docks. Yeah. And, and you're right, we're in some big loading dock area. And, you know, if it, great if the lights turned off, so you're like, well, man, while you're at it, you might as well ask for a shooting star. And so I said, Okay. All right. How about a guy? How about a shooting star? And I mean, was it as soon as my sentence ended, or was it? I mean, it wasn't. Yes. I, it was, it just, was like, just right away. I mean, it was so numbing. I mean, it was just like the hairs on my neck stood up. I mean, and everybody, there's probably, I mean, what in the group? There's probably ten of us just laying on this yeah. concrete slab. I, and I don't. You could have heard a pin drop for about five seconds there because everybody was just, and then we all just lost it. Like, oh my god! Oh my god! You know, and just everybody was freaking <laughs> out. Like, I mean, I, I didn't know what to say, what to do. I was just so dumbfounded by the situation. And then, <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't be having this conversation with you if you asked for a shooting star, honestly, in five minutes later, one, you know, that we'd get a kick out of yeah. that. We'd be like, wow, that's pretty cool. But I, to me, that would be coincidental. But the fact that you asked for one and you got it right. I mean, away, the fact that the lights turned right off. I mean, we were all looking right. around like, who did that? You know, like, did somebody hit the switch? Like, funny. And then, like, right. you know, just uh, our our kind of comical sense anyway. Like, well, fine, man. Since you're getting everything you want, why don't you go ahead and ask him for right. a shooting star? And the, the fact that right. it happened as soon as we asked, that was, that's, I think, just a, it's too much for coincidence, in my opinion. And <laughs> right. It, right. it's just nuts because, like I said, the atmosphere we're in, I mean, we're down there on a mission trip anyway, and just, everything that was going on is just kind of like the cherry on top, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, so I asked, (laughs) I said, I mean, I was just, I was just dumbfounded. So I was like, dude, ask for another one. And you said, nope. And I think your exact words were, I cannot ruin this. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, that is exactly right. So I had reached out to listeners, those of you on our discussion page, patrons, to see if you all had some demon stories or something supernatural come your way at some point in your life. And Tom reached out about something he saw, his friend experience, and for decades he had been convinced that this was an evil spirit. But old Tommy Hall, after discussing this with him, kind of lands in a place to where he suspects mental illness. But maybe it wasn't one or the other. Yeah, well, it was a very strict Bible institution, um, Baptist. I grew up very Baptist, very conservative. And um, I think I was a junior and he was a freshman when he first came in the fall of 97. Yeah. And... um, you know, he had one of those amazing testimonies where I didn't. I grew up in church, but he was like a recovering drug addict, did acid and all this other stuff. But he was known for being really weird at night. Like yeah. he just walk into your room and stare at you and then walk out. And later, some of the other students started talking about <clears throat> where he talked in a different voice. Yeah. Um, and then one weekend, apparently he was sent off to the local hospital because he was hurting himself. Yeah. He had pulled a part of his... Uh, piece of his skin off the side of his head off oh my gosh 
Yeah, it was like it was weird stuff that I, I always left on the weekends because I hated the school I went to. So right. I'd go home on the weekends. Yeah. But uh, apparently he had a lot of emotional um, problems, which later the students kept on saying he's possessed. So one evening they cornered him. And uh, I was in the study hall and this this person came to the room and said, will you please get them out of Taylor's room? He's scaring my roommate. And I was like, what? And he, they're like, go get go get Brandon, the other gentleman who I sent you a screenshot who had also yeah. was there. Um, him and my roommate were trying to get the demon out of it. So it became like this scary, weird situation where I went to the room and I knocked on it. And Taylor and I were friends. And he begged me to make them stop. And it's really like sad voice so it wasn't when, consensual exorcism no no these two had taken upon themselves to try to get this demon out of it and let me interject something that i'm sure our listeners are thinking too and hopefully no skepticism comes across disrespectfully but you said the dude trips on acid like what about this and and i'm sure we'll find out but you can't put this in the drug hallucinogen category well, back then I didn't. He right. had been he had been clean for I think he said like four years he had been clean. He would tell stories of going to a party. One party he went to, he said everything stopped and this woman came up to him and she said, If you sleep with me, you'll live forever. And so he slept with her and the next thing he knew he was vomiting black. That was like one of the stories. Yeah, it was it was always weird stuff. And so I grew up sheltered, grew up Baptist. We didn't, you know, we hardly talk about the Holy Spirit. Demon possessions in Africa. It's not in America. <laughs> um, so it was th- those types of things. So this was my first experience with it, with it. But when I went to his room, as I said earlier, to stop them, he would plead with me. But when he would talk to them, it was this really scary, deep voice that just was menacing. And so I was freaking out. Um, finally, he let me in the room and he was just sitting in the corner and it was just I was stupid. I walked in there, got the guys out, and I was trying to comfort him. He starts screaming at me, just starts throwing a fit and starts saying, your face is melting, your face is melting, and starts digging at his own face. And just for just a second ago, he was saying, Tommy, stop them, and then you guys yeah. go to hell yeah. sort of thing. Well, yeah, yeah it, was, it, was just, it was just that quickly. And so I left, um, called. We had a dean of students who lived under us. I called him and his wife. They came up. Um, all the students on that floor were up. We were we were all awake witnessing this. And next thing I know, they pull us into the room to make a circle around it and start praying. And as we're praying, he's crawling on the animal or crawling on the ground like an animal and just reaching at us, just reaching at us. And it's just it's just scary. He's speaking in tongues. I'd never heard that before. Like I said, Baptist. And it was the scariest night of my life. What what a what an introduction for an innocent <laughs> yeah. little Baptist boy just trying to go to school and make A's and B's. It was about two in the morning. This all started around nine thirty, and at two in the morning it started to calm down. Um, they had got they had gotten Tyler restrained, and um, and they took us out to the lobby and talked to us, and they said we're not sure what we're dealing with. Um, we know that demons are real. He seems to have a lot going on inside of him. They were very vague. They said, just go to bed. Everything's fine. Well, none of us slept that night. And the next morning we went to class. You know, he sat across from me in the classroom. He looked worn out, exhausted. Um, he didn't smile like he usually did. He didn't talk to anybody. So afterwards, I went to one of my favorite professors and told him what happened. And he said, Tommy, everything is not as it seems. So I thought, well, what a prick. He is trying to deny the fact that he is possessed. So as the story goes on, my roommate finds this pastor in Texas and takes him, the demon-possessed guy, to Texas. And he gets the demon exercised to school, and everything seemed normal. Then one night he started confessing stuff to us. He started confessing that he'd stand over me and not wanting to kill me. Um, he would. He said that he would hear voices that would tell him everything that everybody's thinking. And he told us the demon's name, which I've yet to speak its name. Even though I'm really skeptical about demon possession now, I'm still very, I, I, I don't say its name. 
Yeah. I don't. It's let's, it's let's just call him Frankie. Things. Call him Frankie. Yeah, Frankie. Yeah, Frankie Peretti. It was Frankie Peretti was his name. <laughs> but and see, this whole thing took me down a path of reading Frank Peretti shit. Yeah. And I have a book somewhere in my home of um, the Handbook for Spiritual Warfare. Yeah. So for years, it's consumed me. And then one day I realized, what if it's just all mental health issues? So I'm, I'm kind of a skeptic now, but still kind of a believer. So on episode 263 on Pastor With No Answers, last Halloween, we talked to Father Vince Lampert. He's a researched exorcist who's very knowledgeable by experience, very knowledgeable of demons. And I wanted to include this clip. And I'll just go ahead to give you a heads up, man, that uh, for some odd reason last year, I just thought it would be awesome to include some super cheesy Halloween sound effects. Check it out. So I was meeting right. with a woman one time, and she was explaining to me why she believed that she was possessed. And she's sobbing, and she looks at me, and she says, can you help me? And I looked at her and said, Jesus is going to help you. And as soon as I said that, her eyes turned green, her pupils became slanted like a serpent, and this voice came out of her mouth that said, who's he? He has no power over us. And then when I immediately moved towards her to start praying... The demon, these green eyes looking at me, the demon says, you can't get rid of us. We've been here too long, and you're not strong enough. And, and the truth is, I am certainly not strong enough. Because in an exorcism, it's always the power of Jesus Christ that is at work. It's not mine. If we're relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if we're relying on the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, that's where we need to be. I've witnessed the levitation. Uh, during an exorcism where, you know, the demon is laughing uncontrollably, mocking me, cussing, you name it, and then begins to rise up out of the chair. Uh, wow. I've seen, you know, people, eyes roll in the back of the head, the foaming at the mouth. I saw a person's one time where their jaw dropped down and moved off to the side with hideous laughter. I've seen people slither on like snakes on the ground. So... Uh, the manifestations are very much it's, real. But I would tell you that exorcists, over time, we realize that we don't focus on the manifestations. Again, we want to focus on the power of God that is at work in this particular prayer of the church and not the theatrics of the devil. It seems like that would affect you as a person to have to see those sorts of things. Like, for example... Uh, a rescue worker, they're affected by their job. So some aspects of, of my job being a pastor and seeing people go through stuff, that, that affects me. Do you, Would you say that that's, that's kind of the cross that you carry? Like you, you have these images in your head, but hey, you're accepting your calling that God has on you. Yes, absolutely. It does take a toll on you. And I would say even dealing with people that are demon-possessed or they're being afflicted by evil— you know, a lot of times these people are on the fringes. And when you deal with a lot of people that are kind of on the fringes or because a lot of times if you're dealing with the demonic, people might look at you like you're crazy. You know, we live in the Western world where we're quick to say everything must be a mental health issue rather than realizing that there are spiritual realities in this world. So just dealing with people that are kind of on the fringes, it does take a toll on you. That's why, at least from a Catholic perspective, it's so important to be connected with God, to be rooted in the Bible, in Scripture. You know, the, the Word of God is such a powerful thing in defeating the devil. You know, when Jesus is tempted in the, in the desert, he, he quotes Scripture. He throws the Word of God. And in an exorcism, these particular prayers of the church, the ritual, you could say, that the church is throwing the word of God and the aspects of our Christian faith, you know, the, the birth, the, you know, the, of Christ, his suffering, his death and his resurrection, all the things that the devil has rejected, the church is throwing into the face of this demon, basically saying the things that you have rejected is what is going to defeat you. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. So, 
what when the the lady who when you mentioned Jesus that, that you actually saw the manifestation of of demons at that point how conscious is she like is it does she feel imprisoned and it's like this spirit takes over but she's unfortunately consciously along for the ride i've talked to people and that they've told me that that's the case they're like a prisoner in their Gosh. own body other people tell me that once the demon manifests they have no recollection of what is taking place now i can tell you and in that particular oh case gosh. you know the serpent-eyed woman is kind of how I usually refer to her when I tell the story. And it's important to always make the distinction between the person as an individual created in the image and likeness of God and the demon that is now manifesting and taking control of the person's body. But one of the uh, aspects of the ritual of exorcism in the Catholic tradition is the insufflation prayer. It's the breathing on of the face of the person Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the priest will breathe on the face of the person. It goes back to what we said earlier. Wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. And so I breathed on the face of the person very gently. But when I did that, it was like the person was hit with a hurricane force wind. The chair flew back 10 feet and hit the wall. And there was a shriek and the person came flying up out of the chair and collapsed on the floor. And then myself and the other priest that was with me lifted the lady off the floor, and she's beaming as bright as the sun, and all the manifestations of evil are gone. Kind of in, you know, in the scripture accounts, there's always this sense of shriek, and then the person, the demon comes out, and the person is now free. All right, so Jared, we will lose all credibility. You understand by the by the time we finish telling the story, if we haven't already lost our credibility, we'll lose it now. <laughs> We're talking about something that happened. Basically, I'm fresh out of high school. <laughs> You're like a freshman or sophomore in college. We're like, but seriously, man, but seriously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious. Going into it, I had zero expectation. For me, it was just something fun to do with the guys. Maybe, I, I don't know, was Jennifer there, my girlfriend? I think so. I, it, yeah. It, yeah, so it was just something fun to do. We're young. We get, you know, we hear about this thing that you can do and maybe see something supernatural. Would, would that represent your posture also? Like, eh, we're not going to see anything. I think that I was probably a little bit more... Um, excited about the prospect of experiencing the supernatural. I, I've always kind of, even at an early age, been interested in um, weird phenomenon, whether it's like paranormal, aliens, ghosts, yeah. whatever. So I, I kind of thought there there was a slight chance. Now, you know, I'd say probably 75% chance. I was thinking this is going to be for fun like you, but there was something based on what they were saying about their experiences. I forgot. I think it might've been Jason Basil or John. Yeah based on what they were saying, it, it sounded like they experienced something they, they really thought was real. So I knew I wasn't being BSed. So I was excited about the prospect of actually experiencing something for real. So yeah, was that? I don't think they had ever experienced what we all experienced okay. together. And here, here's what I want to tell our listeners is I understand we're young, but you have to understand that whatever it was, it was so obviously not a normal thing that not once, but twice, the driver sped away. Now, the second time we told him, Jason, please don't drive away this time. Let this thing walk up to us. And he could not help himself. Both times, he sped off. I don't know if you remember how pissed we are the second time. Yeah. We were like, damn it, Jason. Right. Like, we want to see what the Or at least thing drive is. to it. This would be the Ravenel light kind of out in the country of Charleston. And... Basically, there was some sort of ritual that had to do with your headlights on the car knocking on the door of the church. I'm curious, do you think that the ritual had anything to do with it to the degree of if we didn't do it right, it wouldn't have happened? Like, do you see there a tie in with the ritual? 
Well, I mean, if you think historically, you know, witches, warlocks, they have ritualized spells that they have to perform in order to conjure spirits. So yeah. there's a there's a historical precedence for it. Now, again, if what we saw, what, what it was, I don't know. But if it was something linked to the supernatural or at least a spiritual realm, I think there is something to rituals. Right. So. Yeah. All right. So I'll tell you what I recall and interrupt me, whatever. I obviously want to hear your sentiments of the whole situation, too. So after we we flash the lights, we're, we're sitting in the middle of the road. Very, very, very little traffic. I mean, it would have been a shock if someone drove because it was super late and it was in a pretty obscure part of, of town. But it was still dangerous for us because we had the lights completely off. And so we're sitting in the dead of night, completely dark, except for some of the light coming from the church and very, very, very quiet. And I remember the first thing I saw was a little bit, uh, I would say, maybe 50 yards away. I saw like some sort of an image on the on the right side of the road. And it was uh, like a dark image, but I could see something. If that is all that I ever saw, I wouldn't be talking to you about this ever again, because I could easily put that in the category of I was looking for something. I, it, it was in my head and all of that. But... After seeing that, and I do remember some other people saw it because they're like, whoa, 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 Did you, are you seeing that? <clears throat> but it wasn't super obvious. But then the next thing we actually see, and I would say, what, 300 yards down the road, the best way that I could describe it would be if you had a guy from the 1800s carrying one of those lanterns, kerosene lantern, I guess is what mm -hmm. they are. Mm-hmm. So if you saw a guy way down the road walking casually towards you with that light, you know, basically if you're walking with that light, the light kind of goes back and forth a little bit, nothing frantic. But that light appeared out of nowhere in the middle of the road. And so obviously our listeners, you can believe this or not, my conclusion is one of two things. There's actually a person there that just has the night of their life when he <laughs> sees those headlights click three times because it's like, yes, I get to spook out a bunch of high schoolers again. Or there's something supernatural because in my mind, there was no way that we could have confused that with anything else. Not a car going by, not a light from a car. It was smack dab in the middle of the road. It was a light that appeared from nowhere, and it got closer and closer and closer. And obviously, like I said, our driver neither time wait ne neither time waited for it to come a little bit closer. But yeah. fill in some gaps there. Is that pretty much what you remember? Yeah, I think I think for me the big thing is if I was if I was walking in the woods or walking on that road at night. And I saw what I saw. I'd be like, that is really weird. I have no idea what it is, but that's super strange. But the fact that we went out there and we did something to try to conjure what we eventually saw, that's what made it so weird, even especially weird. So, you yeah. know, it's inexplicable. It's, I, we don't know. I don't know what it was, but the fact that we did that little ritual ceremony or whatever it was, and then that kind of prompted the thing to occur. Uh, right. That is creepy as hell, and that, that's where I kind of think that it might there might be something to this being quote unquote ghost or whatever. Um, regarding your fill in the blanks, I mean, I think you did a great job of capturing that's that's what I saw too. Everything you, yeah. you described is what I saw. The bottom line is, why the hell do we speed away, speed off in the opposite direction? I wonder. Right. I, I was actually running towards there, but then when I knew the truck was going to take off without me, I was like, all right, screw that. But really, I, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I was on my way. I I, I needed to know what that was. <laughs> but I didn't want to be left behind either in the middle of riding yeah. up.